So I'm Joe Palazzato, and I'm a senior vice president at Quizlix, and I don't have any restaurant or bar tips to offer you, unfortunately, so uh, I want to quell that disappointment right up front. Uh, on behalf of Quizlix, it's my pleasure. First of all, I want to thank Bloomberg for organizing this big law summit and for assembling such an impressive array of uh, speakers. Uh, it looks like a, a really interesting program. The discussions you will hear today, starting with the first panel, are in one sense timeless, yet in a different sense remain critically important as the face of big law continues to evolve. After 25 years as a senior lawyer at two large banks, I'm happy to be working at a company like Quizlix, which provides managed legal process solutions for both corporate law departments and for law firms. Personally, I've gone from being both a voracious provider and a consumer of legal services. From there, I've gone to at Quizlix thinking about how process solutions can make the lives of both in-house lawyers and outside counsel easier as we go forward with technology and everything else. I will say, quite honestly, the view is actually much better from where I sit now than where I sat uh, previously in my, in my prior lives. Uh, the opening panel is titled Complying with the Times. Our panelists will share their experiences on how to keep pace with, if not stay ahead of, evolving regulatory changes and what pressures they might be encountering that prevent them from doing this critical task effectively. By the way, and this is the last infomercial we'll have, this is what, where Quizlix fits in, and I'm happy to talk to anybody at, at the next break. As I said, the, time, the topic's a timeless one, but also critical during a time of shifting governmental and regulatory priorities. While the new administration may have promised a more, a more benign or a kinder and gentler regulatory environment, if you will, my experience tells me that each and every company and each and every industry sector is but one scandal away from a full-fledged legal crisis. So on that cheery note, it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa Reut Reutman, who is in Entity Intelligence at Bloomberg. Lisa will be our moderator on the first panel. So thank you for that, Joe, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I have to say, I was actually kind of excited, Sona, that you said that um, this is what was requested from, from last year. As a former chief compliance officer, that's, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Usually people start to fall asleep when you start talking about compliance. So this panel today is indeed called Complying with the Times. And what we thought we would talk about and sort of recognize is that not only are you dealing with shifting regulatory uh, requirements and enforcement priorities, um, but even drivers for success in your business and how we build successful relationships with our outside councils. Um, we've put together a dynamic panel of practitioners. All of them have unique backgrounds and we hope that you will come away with some actionable insights that you can take back to your organizations. And for those of you in private practice, hopefully this is a little bit of a peek behind the curtain at what goes on uh, in-house. And so with that, I would like to introduce my panel. Um, I have Ingrid Busan hall who's a director at financial regulation at PayPal, and Michael Butowski, who's an attorney at Jones Day here in New York, and Patrick Spies, who's the assistant general counsel that focuses on regulatory compliance at US Steel, and Deborah Kaback, who's the chief legal officer at Oppenheimer Asset Management. So thank you all for being here. So I have asked each of them, as we have this discussion, the first time they speak, to just give you one or two sentences about what they do in their departments. Um, and so with that, the first question actually goes to all of you. Um, you know, the real question is, and, and as Joe aptly put it, how do you keep up with continually changing legal and regulatory requirements? And Ingrid, maybe you can start us off. Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Lisa, and thanks to Bloomberg and the great staff here for um, all, they work, all the work they've done uh, to bring us together here. And thank you for, for attending and participating. And one thing, uh, if you have questions throughout the course of the discussion here, I think we're entirely open to taking those. Um, and we won't necessarily wait until the end. So feel free to interrupt. So I'm Ingrid Busson hall I am the mm -hmm. head of financial regulation at PayPal. I joined about a year ago. 
it's a really exciting time for us uh, and certainly for me based on what I do. So I've always sat on the legal side, but always working hand in glove with compliance. And that's what I do today uh, and provide advisory services across the company, but really partnering uh, every single day, frankly, with compliance, which is a function that we've elevated significantly in the last year within PayPal. Uh, the, our chief compliance officer, Eric Karchmer, who also joined a year ago, he uh, reports directly to the CEO and reports into the audit committee. And structural uh, pieces, uh, it, where compliance sits within the organization is one of the topics that we'll cover later on. Uh, but that's, that's a little bit about, um, structurally about PayPal and then just general, generally what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a great mix of things. It's uh, dealing with regulatory change, which I promise to get to um, in a moment. And uh, it's working on uh, due diligence for our uh, strategic acquisitions, <coughs> strategic transactions, uh, a fair amount of internal investigations, uh, regulatory investigations, and the like. So on, on change management, I mean, I think for anyone in financial services, and it's not just financial services, but certainly since the crisis, we've all been really in deep on uh, change management. And it's been a long, hard slog. And uh, the winds continually shift. And so one of the things that uh, I think about really carefully, frankly, is regulatory fatigue. So in terms of you know, best practices on change management, you should by now uh, you know, have a playbook. If you're in a heavily regulated industry, you know who the key players are. You will identify them. You hopefully will get stakeholder engagement um, as early on in the process as possible. So if something's been proposed, that shouldn't be something that's handled exclusively by legal and compliance. That should involve everyone who's potentially affected, right? Whether it's finance or ops or um, the, the business, of course. Uh, and, and so then you, you then have an established set of relationships that follow through up until the point where you actually get a you know, final rule that you ne need to then mobilize around. Um, and that, I think, is the best way to set yourself up for success. That being said, uh, on regulatory fatigue, there's a lot of it. It's just, it's, it's, it's a reality. And so I think from the legal and compliance side, we need to be cognizant of that and how we're often going to the same stakeholders on a repeat basis. They have their normal everyday jobs to do. This is something that, not that we don't have other things to do as well, right? But th we live this life every single day. So it's not new and novel. You're gonna have stakeholders who've never done this before, aren't used to the burdens. This might be a significant change for them in their business in the way that it's run before. Uh, you might have stakeholders who've just run through this process with you a few too many times. Uh, so. Just being cognizant and, and humanizing that process, um, I think, is really critical. That's great. And Deborah, I'm going to jump to you. Maybe okay. you could tell us a little bit. Well, first of all, a little bit about what you do, sure. as well as you know, sort of how, how you I guys sort of handle the changing legal and regulatory sure. landscape. Uh, I'm chief legal officer for Oppenheimer Asset Management, which is a registered investment advisor and an affiliate of Oppenheimer & Co. Inc., which is a broker dealer and a registered investment advisor. All of our products are sold through the broker dealer, so uh, you know, broker dealer laws also apply to how we market our products, and we have to be cognizant of that. Uh, and you know, we have the SEC, and we have FINRA, and you know, we have both sets of regulators. So I handle legal issues for the advisory business, but I also have some oddball things that have come under me, like pay-to-play approvals, which you know are not just the SEC rule on pay-to-play, but state and local, <coughs> and um, you know G37, G38. Now FINRA has a rule, you know all of that, and then government solicitations for lobbying it has nothing to do with asset management, but it just I inherited it somehow. Well, you know, when you draft a policy on political <laughs> contributions, having gone to 
Skadden seminar and then saying, well, we also have to be concerned about gifts and we also have, then it, then it comes to you. So, you know, I open my big mouth. So I handle those things as well. How I, I keep up with changes in the law, I'm on every distribution for every law firm, it seems, that we've ever used, which is great. And Especially they, Jones Day. Yeah. Of yeah. course Jones Day. Yeah. And we are a client of Jones Day. So we get a lot of commentaries from law firms on things that are directly relevant to me and other things that I really don't care about and then I delete. The things that are directly relevant, obviously, I have to read. Uh, we also have there's newsletters, there's you know, compliance firms send these things out. I mean, you, you get a lot of that stuff, which is very helpful. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the firm is also looking into um, a vendor solution for updating compliance manuals so that we're not relying on the person who's in charge of that manual saying, oh, by the way, you know, Reg D was amended and we have to make some changes in the private placement policy and then that human has to go in and do it on a timely basis. So um, a vendor solution would be, and, and we haven't finalized it yet, but presumably we'll have some human approval that has to go in, but the vendor would maybe send an alert and say you need to change of law in this particular section, you need to update that. So those are, we're looking into some of those things that would provide, um, you wouldn't just have to rely on people knowing that they have to do certain things. I mean, there are a lot of things that are very high profile and everybody is going to be aware of it. Is there anyone in this room that doesn't know about the DOL fiduciary rule, even if it doesn't pertain to you? I mean, it, it's just been talked about a lot. And other things that are, um, more technical, but nevertheless, you have to change to keep up to date. Great. Now, okay. Patrick, you're the outlier on this panel, not <laughs> being in the traditional financial services space. Tell us a little bit about the, so your remit for your business um, is in regulatory and change. So tell us a little bit about what you do, as well as, um, you know, sort of how do you keep up to date and handle regulatory changes? Sure. Uh, my, my name is Patrick Spies. I'm the Assistant General Counsel for Regulatory and Compliance at U.S. Steel. And um, within our team, we sometimes talk about how, as Deborah mentioned, she has sort of the oddballs. And in, in a way, that's sort of our, uh, you know, we call ourselves sort of the bucket of miscellaneous. Anything that doesn't neatly fit into the corporate transactional world, which is a different group within our law department, or the litigation side, which is a separate group, uh, ends up coming to our group. So we're sort of our core responsibilities are things like anti-corruption, antitrust, economic sanctions, export controls, lobbying, political contributions, things like that, but also anything else that doesn't fit into uh, transactional work or litigation work uh, ends up coming, coming to our group. And so you can imagine that with that breadth of responsibility, there are sometimes questions that come up in areas where no one in our group has particular expertise, um, and there are many questions across a, the wide range of uh, of areas of law where we do have expertise. So the way that we try to manage keeping up with laws and regulations that apply to our business uh, is number one, by having trying to build subject matter expertise within our department so that, for example, we have an attorney who has now become our data <coughs> privacy expert. So uh, she tries to keep up to date on developments in data privacy, and that means getting on the distribution list and interfacing with outside counsel uh, by working regularly with outside counsel, sort of in the spirit of the, of the summit, I think that you can build relationships so that uh, even though we're responsible for a wide range of areas of law, outside counsel usually are the experts, and so they more closely track developments in the law, and if you have a good working relationship with outside counsel, then a lot of times they will flag developments for you, um, and th that's one thing that we've found to be incredibly helpful. That's great. So, Michael, this naturally turns to you. Yeah. Um, you know, this change and keeping in touch with what's going on um, as the world changes around us is not unique to corporations. From a law firm perspective, how is it that you handle change? I'm uh, Michael Butowski. I'm at uh, Jones Day. I'm located in the New York office. Uh, and my daily life is mostly a combination of advising clients on broker deal or investment advisor regulation and investment company regulation and also organizing and uh, managing hedge funds and private equity funds. Um, in answer to your question, I mean, for 
both within a law firm and what I would suggest for people outside, you know, I think they're the usual things you can imagine, like, you know, signing up for RSS feeds for the regulators so you get announcements as they come out. You have to be careful, of course, as Ingrid mentioned, about, you know, fatigue, but it's the only way you hit things, you know, right, right up front. But one thing I was going to mention, though, that I think that's, at least in the financial services sector, what's cropped up a lot are these uh, monthly discussion groups, and I just want to mention those for a second, because a lot of times what will happen is part of the art to the game is sort of knowing what the regulators are focused on, and so many times that's not written anywhere. So many times it's spread by word of mouth. You know, somebody got examined. They, did you know the regulator brought this up um, or that? And things spread like wildfire all over, this, all over the city, probably around the country. But if you're not in these monthly discussion groups, you don't hear about those. And so one of the things I was just going to say is that it's important to join as many groups, organized, disorganized. There, there are a lot of them. A lot of the law firms have them. Uh, there's... There are also some that some of the compliance organizations put on. But hearing the nuances, um, I wish I could give you an example, but there are, there are numerous instances where we've heard of like interpretations that the regulators are taking that they might never have taken before about certain provisions under the Advisors Act. And you, know, you want to go back after hearing about it in one of these discussion sessions and ask, you know, is, there, you know, is there an issue? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you one that's, that, that's an example. I'm in the employment context, okay? The SEC came out with, a, um, with a, uh, an alert, I guess, about four or five months ago about how they were going to focus more, more clearly on, pe on advisors and brokers that have hired people with uh, negative backgrounds or disciplinary backgrounds, okay? But at the same time, you have, if you just Google ban the box legislation, you'll find that it's actually a violation of law in many places, in many states, to check people's backgrounds before you invite them in for interviews, okay? So I don't think the SEC thought about that when they put that alert out, okay? So they're, you know, it's, it's a little bit of sort of like, so hearing what's going on on the street um, and talking to people that are in similar positions to you. Um, and I would yeah. echo that. I mean, I, yeah. I've, you know, Michael has run a, um, an informal CCO group for almost the last dozen years, and I, I know Deborah and I both participate, so yeah. um, I, I agree. You know, benchmarking against your peers yeah. is, is always extremely helpful. Yeah. Um, so, Ingrid, can you talk a little bit, being, I know you're at a new firm, but um, <laughs> speak about sort of the evolution of the in-house legal department and compliance departments? Yeah, and, and I'm going to take that broadly, right, yes. sort of from an industry perspective, right? I think for those of you in financial services and, and likely in other industries, but I, I can only speak from financial services, there's just been a, a sea change, right, in, um, in the way uh, we're organized around compliance. And I think consequently um, the impacts are felt uh, across the organization, but certainly within legal. So. Uh, when I went in-house 12 years ago, I went to a foreign bank. One of my former colleagues is here in the audience. Uh, our compliance department, I think, between the bank and broker-dealer, for about 1,000 people, right? We were 1,000 people across the broker-dealer and bank. We had six compliance officers, I think, um, and that was across the board, right? That was the folks who did anything related to AML and sanctions to the broker-dealer to just across the board, right? And so I actually don't know what the number is today, but I did see it increase significantly uh, while I was there. And, and that is the common experience, right? Uh, in part because of changes to, uh, you know, actual changes statutorily in, in, in the regulations, but then also as many in the audience no doubt have experienced or certainly read about uh, through enforcement actions, right? And so for prudential regulators, certainly they have come in and said, we think you know, to right size you for compliance, you've got this many employees, this is the nature of your operations, we expect you to have 100, 1,000, whatever it is, right? Um, and, and so that may be a recommendation, but uh, in most circumstances where that conversation is taking place, that is um, a mandate. Uh, and so we've seen increasing numbers go into compliance. We've seen a lot of lawyers go into compliance. Um, we've seen the stature of compliance really significantly change, right? It, it used to be that people would run away from, and probably that's still the case um, in many instances, right? But 
I think by elevating the stature, by virtue of the fact, and again, we can talk about organizationally what makes the most sense, and that's going to vary from one institution to another, right? Whether it's a direct line into the CEO as we have at PayPal, whether it's through legal, whether it's through risk, there's a lot happening in that space, and frankly, I think the, the regulators are having a lot of impact on that. Um, but uh, that to the side, it's it's fair to say that the stature has been elevated, and as a consequence, that really does change the perception internally, right? That this is not just a, oh, like, yes, that compliance training, I have to do that every, every year, let me just slog through that, and then people don't think about their compliance obligations anymore. And I think uh, if, if you have at the senior management level that tone at the top of compliance is one of our core values, we, we mean it when we say it, and there are actual consequences um, for individuals if they don't comply. One of the means by which we do that is making compliance a component of the evaluation process and, frankly, in compensation decisions. Uh, so I think that 15 years ago, 10 years ago, was, was anathema, right? And so I think we've come, come a long way. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And Deborah, I know that you touched a little bit upon the fact that you're leveraging, you see more of a leveraging of technology in compliance. Have you also seen sort of an increase in staff and, and sort of yes. how the... Yes. I, if you follow the financial services industry, whenever a firm has an enforcement action, they hire. <laughs> they add to their staff, not to be cynical about it, but that's how it happens. So... Um, Enforcement actions across the industry, firms beef up their compliance staff, and if things calm down, sometimes they reduce their compliance staff. That's been also known to happen. Uh, I think, uh, certainly in our firm, and I think this is more of a trend in financial services also, it used to be legal and compliance were one group. I don't think that that's very common anymore. Uh, I think I think it's rare to see that. I think you only see that at a, at a small shop, maybe a small hedge fund or something like that. Bigger financial services organizations have compliance separate from legal. Uh, the compliance function, the CCO could be a lawyer, doesn't have to be a lawyer. Obviously, if the SEC has made it plain that if you are a CCO and you're a lawyer, you cannot claim attorney-client privilege. You have waived that. So it doesn't do you any good. I mean, you can have the CCO have the legal knowledge, and that's helpful. You can't claim privilege for that, and the, the mandated reports are not considered to be privileged anyway, so you really don't get anything from that. Uh, I, I think that it's very important for, even if they're separate, for legal and compliance to work closely together, not on everything, obviously. Compliance does the testing function. I don't test anything. You know? But it's very important to work on you know, developments of the law, what are the issues that we have to, new procedures, what do we need to do, uh, and to make sure that um, we work together on those, on those things. And, and we generally do. So I, I would think that a lot of departments will be separate, but we'll have a lot of overlap. And I, this, I might be jumping ahead to one of our other topics, but um, when you have the overlap, obviously you have to be sure who's doing what, and not you know one person thinks that the other one is doing it. That's disaster. But you know, if you have a good working relationship, I think you establish that you know fairly quickly. Sure. And Patrick, can you just touch upon sort of the structure of your legal and compliance departments and sort of where compliance sits in the corporate structure and what happens when <laughs> legal thinks they own a topic and compliance thinks they own it? Sure. For, for us, it's actually maybe a little bit easier. Um, unlike in the financial services industry and some of the other highly regulated industries, uh, we have a dual-headed general counsel chief compliance officer, one person who fits both roles, and so as a result, uh, our regulatory and compliance group, which I'm a part of, is part of the legal department. So compliance is uh, sort of in the, uh, uh, to the 
opposite of what Deborah was describing. It's, okay. it's really integrated, and I think that the point about making sure that you know who's handling what is important, and it's also important to uh, ensure that the advice that is being given out by compliance versus the legal department is consistent. And for, for us at U.S. Steel, and I think um, in less highly regulated industries, I don't think that um, it's really a company-by-company company decision. It's what, what works for the company, and I think that um, part of it, at least in our experience, depends on uh, who the person is who's necessarily filling that role. And so our general counsel has a deep background and experience in business ethics and corporate governance, and so that makes it uh, a little bit easier to, to marry those roles together. And Michael, you obviously see this from a client perspective. You must see a whole lot of differences across the board in the base of clients that you represent in terms of how they structure their compliance in legal departments. Yeah. Well, and mostly in the way also that they interact with the law firms um, too. And I think, you know, the, the biggest changes that have been occurring, sort of the evolution, you know, for us has been in, you know, specifically in the regulatory area is the, uh, the 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 sorry loss of softball questions. Okay, um, to put it to put it bluntly, I mean, it used to be, you know, um, that throughout a day, you know, if you get peppered with regulatory questions throughout the day, you could count on maybe 30, 40 percent of them to be ones that you just knew the answer to. Okay, but now, you know, with with people being, you know, in house, having you know significantly more access to information, by the time they decide to call someone like me. They either already know the answer and they're just looking for somebody to tell them that they're correct, um, maybe to, you know, to, to help them with the business people to say, so that they can say they checked with outside counsel and they said it too. Um, or maybe they're looking for a statement about like industry practice you know, because maybe they, they want to just get certainty about what they've said, that they want to know that everybody else is doing it or nobody else is doing it. Because so many of the things that have to be interpreted, you can interpret something one way or the other and you want to know if everybody else is you know, is doing the, doing the same thing. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what I see more as the trend. The other thing, I guess, with legal and compliance, it's, it's interesting hearing everybody's answers because, um, you know, inherently in any sort of compliance function, there's, there's a legal element to it, too. There might just be, there might be the testing, but, for example, you're filing a 13D. Compliance might take on that role, okay? Um, who are the beneficial owners? That's inherently a legal analysis, okay? Does compliance go to legal every time they do a 13D? Depends on the firm, okay? Um, so it's, it is all over the map in, in that way. It depends on the expertise of the people internally. It also depends on whether or not a, there's been a, a sort of a dividing line that's developed over time. Um, what I have seen, though, where, where there's been problems over the years and firms have started to you know, get, get past it, you know, by cooperating more with each other is exactly what Deborah mentioned is I have seen situations where something fell through the cracks because um, somebody, you know, both legal and compliance knew about something and one thought the other was taking care of it yeah. and the other thought the other was taking care of it and nobody took care of it. And we had one situation I remember on an exam where the SEC is a, uh, as a, as a measure uh, mandated that the firm put in, put in place a specific policy to deal with talking to each other, making sure compliance and legal knew when to talk to each other, because they, they just didn't. You know. Wow. That's yeah. Part of that is email culture, I'm yeah. afraid, that, yeah. you know, a lot of times just picking up the phone and talking to someone yeah. would solve something in about Two 10 seconds, seconds yeah. Yeah. or, heaven forbid, going to the office to meet the person. And the email thing, nuances get lost in emails. Yeah. There could be 20 people on an email chain. They all chirp up with, I, they ask a question, they don't get the answer, and you're yeah. like, stop. Well, that like, policy yeah. that I just mentioned, I had to write it. It was one of the hardest policies I've ever written because if you think about <laughs> writing down when people, under what circumstances, people will call each other. On it's Friday. very hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. like, hard exactly. and ridiculous yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. I, mean, yes. I, I think on that um, really it has to be regardless of you know what the org chart looks like ultimately there has to be an understanding of partnership and collaboration it's human, yeah. and it's it, it really <clears throat> fundamentally human endeavor right and then perceptions of power structures right and there have been times in my career where and I have always been on the legal side so I've been part of this 
messaging and we're not always doing it consciously, but there has been a sense of, well, legal is really the final arbiter or we're better than compliance or because compliance doesn't have as many lawyers or mm, the lawyers that go to compliance are not really that great, right? That we have to just take off the table. It is not helpful to us as individuals and it is definitely not helpful to the institutions we serve, right? We all have different jobs um, and we need to partner effectively to get those jobs done. Otherwise, things inevitably will fall, fall through the cracks. And that's but just another the place for tone of the top, right? You, I mean, you need to make sure that well, you're making, you know, while you in legal and compliance need to have mutual respect for one another, you need to make sure that right. senior management feels that same sort of sense Definitely. of, you know, of, of responsibility. Well, then there's also the game of, I'll go to, I'll go to legal, I'll get an answer. If I don't like it, I'll go to compliance and maybe I'll get a better answer. Not knowing that we're going to talk to each other. <laughs> and just and if we don't agree, we'll talk it out and make sure we agree. It's but the same that, forum that shopping we do with law firms, right? Pardon me? It's the same forum shopping we do with law firms. It can happen. <laughs> it can happen. Most of the time we laugh about it. Yeah. That's great. Well, we look, we promised some actionable insights, and Ingrid, I think you've done, a, you know, that was great comments in terms of sort of incorporating, um, having a culture of compliance feel, you know, sort of filter through into your um, annual reviews and, uh, and even, um, you know, sort of pay discussions. Um, what else do you do in terms of training, in terms of preparing folks at a senior level to really have the right tone? Um, what are some, you know, some tips that we can, that we can share? Yeah. Well, one, one of the things that I wanted to focus on was uh, how we treat uh, employee hotlines, right, as a core element of or you know, opportunities for whistleblowers to, to report independently. It doesn't have to be hello on the phone or through email. It can actually be live and in person sometimes, which is often most helpful. But um, making sure that those are valuable and meaningful opportunities for employees who have, in their mind, truly legitimate concerns about what is happening at the company. And that's where, at least, at least for me, uh, th that's where uh, one of the areas where I uh, partner on a day-to-day -day basis with compliance, right? And to the point of tone and how do you message across the organization uh, what the, the importance of compliance institutionally and, and, and the role of legal is where and as appropriate, and certainly in these instances, demonstrating to individuals that legal and compliance are in partnership, right? working collaboratively to, to get to the answers. Uh, so I, I think employee hotlines are a critical pulse point, frankly, for the institution. Uh, those issues need to be um, investigated and treated uh, with appropriate due care. And I, I used this word before, and I feel like it's a theme running throughout the, the comments, but <coughs> there is a human element there, right? For someone to actually get to the point to say, really uncomfortable with what's going on here. I don't like a decision that my manager made or what have you, right? I'm gonna actually write an email about that or I'm gonna pick up the phone or I'm gonna schedule a meeting with a lawyer. I don't really know lawyers, but like I need to talk to someone. Think about that process taking place and utilize that when dealing with those individuals. Um, and again, that I think making sure that every interaction where people are dealing with us, that there's, there's that element there. Absolutely. All right, Patrick, from you, actionable insight, um, sure. training. Sure. I, yeah, I think that um, to sort of, to, to Ingrid's point, I think that the, the human element is, is really important because when you're thinking about building a culture of compliance at a company, it certainly has to be the tone at the top where employees know that senior management, mid-level management, the board, everybody is on the same page with respect to the importance of things like ethical business practices and compliance with laws and regulations. And that means that for legal and compliance professionals, it's not just being the person w who employees go to when there's a problem or being the person who they never, they never hear your name or see your face uh, other than when there's a problem and you're going in to try to clean something up after the fact. I think that it's important 
to build relationships early on with employees in the different business units. And you can do that through training, through in-person training. Uh, a lot of times it's good to have uh, senior management present at training so that employees understand that culturally as a company, there is that commitment to compliance from the top on down. And I think that that helps facilitate things like reporting issues because if you go out and deliver a training presentation to 50 employees, then at least they know who you are. And if they have a question or if they have an issue in the future, maybe you're not the right person within the law department to answer that or help them, but at least they, they can put a name with a face and they know somebody to reach out to to raise that issue. And that's something that helps build that culture of compliance. Absolutely. And Deborah, what about from you? Last thoughts on creating a culture of compliance and some actionable insight? Well, on the whistleblower thing, I think it, it's helpful for organizations of, of a certain size to, to have a third party, an independent ombudsman or someone for calls to go to because I think if those calls go to a senior legal or compliance person, um, you don't quite have that independence and there might be a tendency to minimize the, the concern, to say, oh, well, this person didn't get a good raise, this person is unhappy or disgruntled, and, and they may in fact be, and maybe it's not legitimate. But you better be sure about that. And, even, and someone who could be disgruntled could still have some legitimate concern. So the fact that the person is unhappy about salary or whatever doesn't mean that, that the concern is not legitimate and shouldn't be investigated. So I think that the personal element people who know the employee or know the person's boss has to be removed from the review of what the concern actually is because if you dismiss those things and then the person goes to the SEC, you're going to have a much bigger problem than if you had dealt with it on a timely and impartial basis. So that's something that I, I think is fairly significant. Right. And Michael, I know we've had multiple conversations about this. So. Yeah. Well, just that, um, you know, I was just going to point out that from an SEC's po the SEC's point of view, since the early 2000s, they've made it part of their, you know, mixed it in with their exams, the questions and issues about the culture of compliance and tone from the top, um, you know, the inherent concept underlying it being that, you know, the tone from the top is, if it's right, that's the only thing that really facilitates compliance, being able to do their job. So they look to whether or not, you know, compliance is really like independent and has the right resources. And even on exams, one of the first few exam questions that you get from the SEC is, um, has the compliance officer asked for anything, any gadgets, any compliance resources that, that you haven't uh, given them? Okay, and that's a, it's a heck of a thing to write back on an exam r response letter to tell the SEC, well, I asked for the $50,000 gadget and I didn't get it. So, but that's one of the questions. So they do get at that. Right. And my joke yeah. with the SEC examiners, they don't find it terribly amusing, but I do. Yeah. Um, the, there's a rule under the Investment Company Act that says you have to have a compliance officer and they have to do a written report and blah, 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 and that it's a substantive violation of the rule to attempt to intimidate the compliance officer. Well, there's a parallel rule under the Advisors Act. But it's okay if you intimidate. There's nothing that prevents you from intimidating the compliance officer. So I've always you know, said if you're going to try to intimidate someone, you've got to do it on the advisor side. Right. Or I've teased the SEC about it and said, well, you know, that's okay, rule. right? Yeah, harmonize they the don't rule. find it funny. No, no sense of humor. None yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. So the one thing I would add to this conversation is that you know, no firm is too small to have a whistleblower hotline. And in many cases, you know, law firms have been very kind to offer up sort of standby services. And it's not really going to cost you anything until someone needs to use it. So you're right. When, when a compliance officer asks for support and asks for resources, you know, the sh excuse should not be we're too small. Um, you know, the, really, that, that is another way of creating the tone from the top is being willing to, you know, take a risk-based approach and, and figure out what works within your means. So that's good. So I know that we are almost finished, and I um, really wanted to take some time because I, I think that this is sort of an important topic to cover. And so, Michael, I'm hoping that you will sort of share with us from a law firm perspective 
How, you know, what advice do you have for us as compliance officers in terms of making sure that we're making the most of our interaction with outside counsel? Well, I think taking into account the trend towards um, uh, specialization in the law firms, I think one of the things that's very, very important is to recognize that, like, let, let's take, for example, let's say you're an investment advisor or broker and you're you're calling the lawyer that you deal with at the law firm. Um, you have to consider whether or not that lawyer knows, number one, the adequate facts that are necessary to address the issue. So let's say you're asking them about a trade. Is this trade okay? All right. Um, if you're talking with somebody who focuses on the Advisors Act, okay, so maybe they'll analyze it from an Advisors Act point of view, that, that issue could raise implications under ERISA. It could also raise implications under, you know, Europe's uh, EMIR or AFMD. If you haven't made clear that you want the person to scour the transaction and make sure it's okay, as opposed to just looking at their narrow specialty, okay, you may be making an assumption. So I call this lawyer. He's in a big firm. I, I assume he's asked everybody in his firm that has anything to do with this. Well, the lawyer on the other side is afraid to do that, okay? He's afraid to do that because he knows if he calls all the people whose specialties have anything to do with this, when he sends you that bill, you're going to yell at him, okay? And so it's, but on the other hand, the client might assume that by having sent, sent the question that it's a big firm, they're taking care of everything. I just assumed they knew that they should check every angle to it. So one of the things I would just point out is to be, it's important to be super clear about what you want done. And you would think that it would be obvious, but it's not, okay? It's, it's not obvious. Um, uh, Yep. Speaking as in house, yeah. isn't it also somewhat incumbent upon you as external counsel to qualify it and say, yeah. you know, I'm giving this advice, but it's limited to a mirror or whatever. Yeah. And so it's a two way street. Yeah. You, know, you can't just be all incumbent upon in No, no, I agree. To, I agree. To, to yeah. The it's question hard. was, isn't it also incumbent upon the, the lawyer that you call to, to make clear, you know, to, to make clear the boundaries of the advice you're giving? And I agree, but it's it should be a two way it should be a two-way street, and sometimes it doesn't happen. Neither, you know, somebody just asks a question, and somebody runs off, and they think about it. They come back, and there's an email that says, "Yeah, it's okay." And everybody assumes what was meant. So I, I agree. It's not just the, it's just not not the clients, you know, that have to do it. It's the lawyers. Um, also, keeping, you know, if you haven't like talked to the lawyer in a while, and then you call them up with a question, maybe some things have changed about your organization that that are relevant. Maybe there are some things that he needs to know about. The, the affiliate, you know, the affiliates in the organization. We, we bought a bank since we last spoke to you, okay? You know, <laughs> right? I mean, so like now Volker's relevant, but the lawyer didn't even know you bought a bank. That bank holding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you know, but, but those things are important because you might just be assuming, what's that? I was thinking of the odd couple. They don't assume because well, that, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, um, I don't know, you, you had mentioned to me about billing guidelines. I guess yeah. that's also something that's relevant too. You know, sometimes... You know, sometimes we see guidelines, you know, that, you know, limit the number of people who can be involved in, you know, on matters. And it would just, you know, if you people take that seriously, you know, which you hope they would, they would um, then you may be limiting the people who the lawyer can interact with. So, um, but I agree. I think, as this gentleman mentioned, it's, it's really about communication, knowing the boundaries of what's being asked and what laws apply and what you want the lawyer to cover. A lot of times also you have to remember, too, mm -hmm. that... A lot of times it's, it's completely reasonable inside at the law firm for the lawyer to assume that it's a narrow question because a lot of times the people internally at the, at the uh, investment banks, for example, are highly accomplished lawyers and they may only be asking the very narrow sure. question because that's all they really want to know. Yeah. So somebody like me goes running off and asks the tax people about the, the principal transaction, again, it, you know, I didn't ask you to do that. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so we have one minute left. Speed right. round. Um, your top... Enforcement concern. Cyber. Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, expense disclosure in, in private equity and hedge funds. That's the soup du jour, I think, still. Patrick? Yeah. I think for, for manufacturing companies, uh, something that's emerging is supply chain transparency and due diligence. Both uh, for a company like us, it's on both sides. So we purchase raw materials from suppliers, and then we are also a supplier to other companies. Right. Deborah? At the moment, I'm thinking a lot about the DOL fiduciary rule just because it's present and it's new. Yeah. I, right now, it's probably not a major enforcement focus, but 
that may change. Yeah. And then cybersecurity, I think, is just a huge risk for yeah. everybody. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to thank the panel. This has been excellent. Thank you so much. And um, coming up next, we have Eileen Nabel Gotts, who's a partner at Wachtel. And again, I'd like to thank you all for participating. Wonderful discussion. <laughs>